Hello, it is November 16th, 2018. I am here in Atlanta, Georgia at the Marriott with Professor Richard Felsen. We are at the uh, annual um, American Society of Criminology meetings. And um, today we are here to discuss Rich's life and professional work and reflections on the field in his own work and uh, perhaps to uh, glean some advice from him on how to pursue a, a productive and um, a worthwhile career in criminology and other pursuits. A bit of a biography here of, of Professor Felsen before we start. Um, he is originally from Cincinnati, Ohio. He received his bachelor's degree with honors from the University of Cincinnati in sociology in 1972. Uh, thereafter, in 1973, he received his master's degree in sociology from Indiana University. Followed in 1977, um, he received his PhD in sociology from Indiana University. He began his career as a lecturer in 1976 at SUNY Albany in sociology. Um, he was tenured and promoted in that same department in 1983 to associate professor and later became a full professor at SUNY Albany in sociology in 1999. He's been at Penn State University in the Department of Sociology and Criminology since 1999, where he still is today. Rich has, it was named a fellow of the American Society of Criminology in 2013. He also um, received a, a, a distinction, a, a award of distinction in the social sciences for research from the College of Liberal Arts at Penn State University in 20, or 2004. He has published numerous articles and books, um, and monographs, his scholarship has appeared in various forms. Uh, perhaps among these uh, various works, he's, he's perhaps best known for um, two of his books. The first um, was, was co-author of James Tedeschi, titled Violence, Aggression, and Course of Action, published in 1994 by the American Psychological Association Press. Later in 2002, he published um, what may be his um, best known work titled Violence and Gender Reexamined, also with the APA Press. He's published numerous articles in Social Science or Social Psychological Quarterly, Criminology, Aggressive Behavior, Journal of Marriage and Family, Journal of Research in Crime and Delinquency, both as a solo author, co authored with many people. Um, and the list is extensive. He's been invited um, uh, and, excuse me, given uh, dozens of invited talks at uh, universities, foundations, received funding from the National Institute of Justice, the National Institute of Health, and has mentored many students who have gone on to have successful careers of their own. So we're here to have a conversation with Rich to um, learn more about perhaps some of the, um, the behind the scenes work that has underpinned much of his scholarship and professional activities. So we'll begin with some of these questions about some of the foundations of uh, your career and perhaps your intellectual pursuits. So Rich, welcome. Um, Thank you. So first I would like to ask uh, um, some questions about your trajectory of becoming a criminologist. And um, so can you give us a little about your life before turning to academic pursuits, perhaps while a young man in Cincinnati, perhaps the things that might have placed you on the trajectory where you are today? All right, well, my father is a very accomplished uh, uh, professor of radiology, and I, had, I have three brothers and a sister, and two of them are lawyers, and three, are, uh, three of us are academics. And um, so I grew up in this household, and I was sort of a cut-up and uh, got minor trouble, but didn't work very hard in school mm. and wasn't serious about it. And then I went to the University of Cincinnati, where my father was actually a professor of medicine, mm. and I went for free. That was nice. Yeah. And, uh, and then I got serious, and I majored in, I couldn't decide, sociology or psychology. So I majored in sociology and minored in psychology. And uh, I, um, I was interested in Goffman. Mm. I was really interested in social psychology, which is a mix, of course. And so I then went to Indiana University, 
uh, partly because I wanted to be close to my girlfriend, who mm. later became my wife mm. and continues to be my wife. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so uh, I, I, I went to Indiana University and you know, got a degree in sociology with a minor in psychology. Mm. And so I was interested in the self-concept and the social psychology of the self-concept. And so you mentioned publishing in Social Psych Quarterly. Well, that's what I was doing, no criminology. But I took, a, in graduate school, I took a course on aggression in the psych department. And I um, thought, well, gee, they could use some symbolic interactionism mm. in this area. So I wrote a paper on aggression as impression management as a graduate student. And um, later that was published in Social Psych Quarterly. And uh, so that was based on a class paper. And I also my first publication, uh, I think before that, was uh, with, with a guy named David Noak. And um, I had an idea. I think it was a good idea. And I said, I went to him and he said, oh, yeah, that's good. Why don't you do that? And he wants you, he's real efficient. He said, well, why don't you write that up this weekend? <laughs> so I don't know if I quite was able to do that. but. I gave it to him, and um, I thought it was pretty good. Mm. And then he re did a second draft, and I couldn't see anything on my draft in his draft. But I was at least smart enough to know that his was better mm. and that this was good. Uh, uh, and uh, he sent it to a American Journal of Sociology, and it was accepted without revision. Mm. So uh, that was Dave Noak was doing, yeah. you know, he was, he, he was sharp. But I was just a beginner. But it, I did have a good idea, and uh, I think I can be creative and come up with good ideas, and, uh, and maybe others, some others are smarter than me, but, you know, a go having a good idea, a good ideas go a long way. That is the currency. Yeah, can and you, uh, although I'll say, sometimes good ideas are not appreciated in the field, creativity is not given the uh, attention that it deserves. Can you give me an example. Well, okay. I um. So the idea that um, for the for gender, that um, that that violence against women might be similar to violence against men and that maybe the motives are similar and that maybe you should compare the two and ask well how is it different mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's that creative that's sort of obvious in a way right uh, but nobody did it it was all tunnel vision right. focused on violence against women they say well how is it different if if it's due to sexism well do the sexist are they more likely to attack women than men? Just ask that question. And um, so, and, and, you know, and then I, uh, a variety of things, like a, 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 a new method for looking at whether situational factors had a causal effect. Right. And so I um, developed that method. I won't go into that. But, you know, that was, um, I thought it was creative. But at times, I think, in the arts and the sciences, creativity may be met early on with suspicion and doubt, but later it's appreciated, many, perhaps many years. Reflecting back on many of the topics that you covered, which we'll get into a bit later, right. do you think the gender work, the situational work, do you think that initial reaction has reversed itself or people have come to appreciate that from a different l light? now that the evidence perhaps has suggested that your initial idea um, was valid? Or is there still, is it still kind of languish? Uh, well, there's a subset of people, I think, who buy into it and accept it. And, um, but, you know, the field is still dominated by activists, ideologues, and they're not you look at, go down to the book exhibit, and you look at the books on intimate partner violence, and you're not going to see them citing me. It's a feminist approach, and that's the dominant approach, and things have even gotten a little more um, uh, fraught, a little more uh, difficult because of uh, 
political correctness and that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. it's, I'm still waiting for, for it to hit big <laughs> <laughs> and hoping I'm alive. <laughs> well, maybe we'll go back to, uh, before we get to some of the topics that we've just uh, discussed, um, your training. Um, aside from uh, mentioning Kenoke, I think I'm pronouncing that correct. Noke, yeah. Noke at Indiana. Are there other people, not necessarily who were part of your graduate training, but other scholars you came into contact with in your formative years, criminologists, sociologists, perhaps some of your father's colleagues that had an influence on you, not only in terms of the, your content interests, but kind of the way you understand the playing field, the, the kind of the arena of ideas people that we may not know right. that have had some impact on you. Right. Well, my father had a great impact on me and um, belief in science, uh, saying what you think, independent thinking, and my mother also, mm. who, who's very independent. Uh, and uh, so they were great influence. And then the family, it, the, uh, it, you know, my father said, uh, conform on the trivial stuff, but on the uh, important stuff, think for yourself mm. and um, so I hope to do that and uh, and he had a strong belief in science um, and uh, so he had an influence of my uh, uh, both of my older brothers uh, one a lawyer and one Marcus Felsen mm -hmm. who you know we've talked hours and hours about things and I have a similar viewpoint on many issues as he does and focusing on concrete things and uh, emphasis on situational factors. He's mm -hmm. got that too. Mm -hmm. And we're both big supporters of each other's work. Um, so, I mean, so, and I use his, sign his book in my class. So I, there's, there's no, I don't, you know. Any other early scholars outside of the family? Oh. People that you might have come into From contact? From reading, you mean, or coming in contact. Or reading, maybe when you were at SUNY. All right, well, um, uh, I mean, George Bornstead at Indiana, my dissertation chair is great, and he, he had an influence on me. And uh, who else? Well, in reading, you know, I always liked Goffman and mm. Inter And I liked, you know, one of the reasons I went into sociology is I want to find out about sort of the hidden aspects of social life mm -hmm. and what's really going on, you know, and we're all polite and going. But um, things. That's not so popular these days. There's a sort of this um, afraid to get into the inner life because it might insult somebody. Mm. And uh, that I don't like. Uh, but, I, but Goffman, I took a course in Goffman as an undergraduate, a graduate course. In Cincinnati? Uh, it's Cincinnati. And uh, so that started me thinking about interaction and face-to-face -face interaction. Then later I studied aggression and violence and, and, and looking at how it stems from disputes mm -hmm. and I got to study disputes and you got to study interpersonal conflict and why don't we get into that as well as j just hitting people mm. uh, and uh, and also there is, um, I, don't be worried about blaming the victim this is not a blaming uh, exercise we're not the court of, we're not a uh, court of law we're supposed to be analyzing social interaction and without regard to blame, we should be interested in cause. And I wrote a paper on that called Blame Analysis, mm -hmm. and a very controversial paper. But you know, don't, you can't be worried. You got to talk about the victim's causal role, because that plays a big role. And I study l later on. I studied ad what I called adversary effects. Mm -hmm. That people pay close attention to the coercive power of their adversaries, because uh, it's a dangerous situation. And um, and so you can't be sitting there worried about, oh, am I making the victim look bad or look good? That's not the point here. The point is to look at how fights develop and uh, what's the motivation. To, to carry on with this, though, going back to something you had mentioned earlier, do you think the concerns about victim blaming and um, some of the discussions about the way we think about victims has in might have um, been a barrier to what you had mentioned earlier uh, uh, to, to, the, to, to the free flow of your ideas or the, the, the degree to which people have accepted your ideas, 
uh, that is the idea that, that, that the, un the reluctance to accept one of so an idea that you may have mentioned earlier that was a bit more, uh, not necessarily provocative, but different, um, might have been a function of people's concern about the types of things you had just mentioned, um, as opposed to any careful and, 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 and neutral observation right. of the evidence. That it, 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 that's an understatement. It really prevented, um, it and still continues to prevent people from considering certain causal arguments. And they're afraid of blaming the victim. And, oh, well, they're not afraid of, I strike that. They're afraid of blaming some victims, victims who are members of protected groups. Mm. And so they, they're in the image game, um, you know, they're activists. They want to protect the image of this, of the groups they're uh, sympathetic with. And I'm sort of, I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in making women look bad or good. I don't care right. about that. That's uninteresting to me. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to talk about if uh, fights between men and women that somebody might provoke somebody. And, uh, and that is part of understanding what happens. And if she kills him, I think men do provoke more, you know. But to say that all women kill in self-defense as if they never get angry, mm. well, this, this is from outer space. <laughs> Can I say that? <laughs> well, so what, what we might, maybe we'll discuss, um, let's, th let's talk about some of the work, I think, we spend more of our time with these topics because it is very interesting. More of your work on some of the topics that we would say in our arena are more controversial or provocative, not necessarily because you are doing them or that your ideas are provocative, but I think when anyone addresses these from a different perspective than what seems to be the prevailing perspective, there's a bit of a pushback. So let's think about or discuss your work on partner violence. I'm curious to know how you came into that work um, given that, from what I can tell, by the time you began to work actively on partner violence, it was the early 90s, you had spent a great deal of your time, which may, maybe we don't have time for today, but working on the self. You have a long and remarkable record of scholarship on the self that had nothing to do with interpersonal violence directly. Um, you dabbled in, you, you, you spent some time in criminology along the way, but suddenly at some point, this became the focus of your research program, and by my count, more than 10 papers it became a book, you then published again, and along the way you continued to encounter what I, from what I remember and what I know, this, these, this, this pushback. So can you explain how, you, you, how the, 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 the manufacture of, the, of these ideas regarding partner violence and then how things may have evolved along the way okay. over the 15 year arc of that? Or so. All right. So I was doing self-concept and some other things, and um, I had this strand of, of interest, this additional interest in aggression, and I saw the self-concept stuff wasn't going anywhere. I didn't think, I didn't. You know, but despite know. the fact that you were publishing, yeah, I was successful in that. But I also, I guess, had some success in the aggression violence area, mm. and. The social psychologists weren't much interested in aggression and violence at mm. that time, but criminologists were, and they had fun meetings. Huh. <laughs> and I liked some of the people. I, right. I, 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 um, and so, and my brother was in that now, right. mm -hmm. by then, and um, he introduced me to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. That was very helpful there. And um, so I moved over into that uh, because there was more of a market for it and because I had an interest in, uh, started developing a greater interest in violence and, um, and aggression as opposed to self-concept. And so I got into studying violence and situational factors of violence. Well, I had, had some interest in right from graduate school in that course I took. And so I'm studying um, situational factors in violence. I'm not thinking about gender. And then somebody criticized me in print for Oh, was I blaming the victim? Now, I wasn't even thinking about gender violence with women, but then I, oh, they, if the woman is a victim, you're not supposed to use my perspective. And how did I get into interpers uh, intimate partner violence? Uh, I remember getting into the study of rape. Mm. And I don't know, it was because I had an idea. When you have an idea, you go for it, uh, and because uh, their ideas are 
difficult to come by. When you think about the work on partner violence, what would you like? What would you like many people to remember from that work? Do you think is the, the, the single most important contribution of that particular stream of work on partner violence? All right, that that um, intimate partner violence stems from disputes and grievances, and that it's important to look at the divergent interests in conflict and how that leads to disputes. And you got to study disputes and why do verbal disputes escalate into physical violence. And that you got to bring into the idea of chivalry because um, you get a violent man who's violent in other circumstances. He's not targeting women. He's targeting women and men. Mm -hmm. And he's stealing and he's a versatile offender. And uh, so, you know, you, what do you expect? He's going to target his wife. They get into conflicts, right? And um, uh, it, it, so he does that, and not just randomly. I mean, there's some provocation sometimes, you know. She, couples can annoy each other or get into conflicts or, or cheat on each other. I did a thing on love triangles. And so they, uh, uh, but it's his violence against his wife is actually, the frequency is lower than, uh, well, let's put it this way. Um, you would expect a violent guy to be violent against his wife, and often he's not, and we should be looking at why, what inhibits men from hitting women. And how can you talk about um, violence against women without talking about chivalry and the norm protecting women and don't hit girls? And if you're not talking about it, it, it you obviously have some other agenda because mm -hmm. that's a key fact. Mm -hmm. A lot of this has had to do with what some psychologist uh, called Bubba psychology. This is Schachter. No, this is Stanley Schachter, famous social psychologist. And he said, like, this Bubba is a Jewish word for gr grandma. And, you know, this is what, what would grandma say? Mm. Well, it's the obvious. Or my father made up a concept called Aunt Minnie. He, sees a, he would look at an x-ray film and he'd say, well, that's an Aunt Minnie. In other words, it's obvious. Mm. Aunt Minnie would know it. And there's a website now called Aunt Minnie, mm. the radiologists who... Uh, you know, what is it, what's the obvious interpretation of this, uh, of this uh, uh, x-ray? And uh, 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 so these are obvious things. I'm more like the emperor, the, the, the little boy and the emperor has no clothes. You know, not too sharp, nothing there. But enough, to, wait a minute, what about chivalry? You're not supposed to hit girls. But theoretically, this seems to have emerged from something I haven't mentioned yet, and that is the perspective that you developed throughout, I think, the 80s and then along the way in your work on, on the self, which emerged in the, your, what I would think is your uh, most prominent work, um, the text with Tedeschi, the social interactionist perspective on aggression. And much, I think, the way you think about partner violence and aggression Correct me if I'm wrong, Rich, but it is often different than the way criminologists are traditionally trained. Mm -hmm. But it's derived from that, right? The, the, those, those parameters of the social interactions perspective. Right. Is, is that right. correct? Can you discuss yeah. that a bit? So and what we learned right. from that. Yeah. So I take a basic social psychological approach, and um, looking at situational factors. And Jim Tedeschi was a psychologist. Now he's, he died a number of years ago, uh, and uh, he and I saw we had common interest in aggression and uh, in violence and we decided to write a book together and that's that book in 1994 and that sort of formed the basis for other things I've done just to look at conflict for uh, as a source of violence and look at how vi face saving and um, people seeking justice or satisfying their grievances or using violence to deter others, and partly as a res it was a response to frustration, aggression type approaches, and it was suggesting that maybe we should view violence and aggression as instrumental behavior, means to an end, 
and ask what they get when they engage in violence. And uh, also, they consider the costs. And uh, it's a basically rational choice, but also an interactionist approach. One, here's one thing I think I regret, I suppose, but I still haven't figured out what the answer is. Should we call it a rational choice approach? Mm. Or should we call it a social interactionist approach? And well, I've gone back and forth. Well, that ain't good. <laughs> but uh, I don't know what, what I should call it, uh, because it's both. And um, rational choice has some excess baggage that mm -hmm. we might not want. Social interactionists, I guess, less excess baggage. So maybe we should be going. Oh, no, I just decided I'm going to use social interactionists. So what, what has criminology, <laughs> what is criminology missing in the study of interpersonal violence from your perspective, from the long view? What, what errors do they continue to commit? as scholars, or what, what lapses in, in the logic of our theoretical understanding? Well, a lot of the theories are just um, uh, re rehashes of what I've seen in social psychology. I, um, I, maybe we should strike that. I don't want to say that about uh, some of my, my friends, but you know, um, it, I'm, I'm looking, you know, at uh, uh, social psychological ideas that, well, strain theory. What, what about frustration aggression, you know? We attacked frustration aggression, but they had a mechanism, and I don't know, strain theory is basically frustration aggression. So um, anyway, uh, I think they need to pay more attention to social psychology, basically. Yeah. What, what concepts of social psychology? So you've discussed uh, so far motive? Yes, motivation. Inhibition. Incentives, inhibitions. Uh, I look at things from more individual, you know, making decisions. The decision-making process. Mm -hmm. uh, and from my emphasis, the, the role of adversaries, mm -hmm. how they take them into account. And, you know, maybe using guns to counter if they think an adversary is more dangerous. And how across... Um, if you want to understand variation across time and space and our crime patterns in the, in the North versus the South, in the U.S. versus Europe, uh, in black versus white communities, you need to study the difference in the quality of the violence as opposed to the quantity. It, you know, young guys engage in fist fights everywhere. But what varies is the gun violence. And you need to look at, well, why does our, do ours why do we have this high rate of gun violence, the, the North and the South? Um, the South doesn't have a high rate of violence. The South has a high rate of gun violence that we found. And um, so you got to tell a story related to the guns. Now, I agree that the sub there's some subculture, there's evidence, and mm -hmm. I accept that there's some subcultural differences in North and South that are pretty convincing. But what I think happens is, um, you get more gun violence in the South because there are more guns, and then that drives out some of the fist fights because it's too dangerous to get in a fist fight when there's lots of guns around. Mm -hmm. So that suppresses the, the, the fist fights, and, you know, that was an idea. You know, a lot of my ideas are sort of common sense, but, uh, I, you know, I, I like simple straightforward ideas. They're often, though, if you read your, your work, I think m many objective reviewers who are in our discipline and perhaps in others would say in the, in the final analysis that the, the approach is always so different theoretically and conceptually than the approach that you would see in the vast majority of work on a topic, case in point, your work on the peculiarities of southern and regional differences in right. violence. And this speaks, I think, to, to kind of your enduring um, interest and embrace of the social interactionist perspective, the ideas found in traditional uh, social psychology. Is that correct? For yes. instance, it, it, you didn't draw on uh, in this work other more prominent contemporary models such as 
we can think of any macro level theory, you went to a different toolbox, which yeah. often doesn't seem to be used nor deployed in the way that you did by other scholars. Is right. that a characteristic yeah. you think of your work that's fair? Am I a nonconformist? And I am a nonconformist, apparently. I don't, I'm not an anti-conformist. I don't try to do the opposite. I want to come up with something different, like many people. But, I mean, you know, that you want it different, but if it's too different, then it's hard to get published. But I can't try to come up with creative ideas that other people haven't thought of. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I'm not a contrarian, although mm -hmm. I'm accused of being a contrarian. Mm -hmm. I hate when people say to me, oh, you just want to provoke people. Mm -hmm. No, I believe in what I'm saying. I, I'm very conventional in my methods, right? I use the standard statistical methods in many ways. You know, I may be a bit of a deviant in criminology, but, you know, my idea is rational choice, social interaction, those aren't crazy ideas. There's plenty of rational choice. That's the dominant perspective in the social sciences. So I'm not, uh, I'm not an anti-conformist. Mm. Uh, I'm a, uh, this, this is a term that comes from social psych, mm -hmm. uh, nonconformist versus anti-conformist. You know, let's talk for a minute about um, what... Uh, I don't wear bow ties like Brendan does. <laughs> <laughs> let's, so in 2002, you published Violence and Gender Reexamined, which seems to be um, uh, a, a, a summation of of your ideas and perhaps a blueprint for what seem to be future work by not only you but others empirically on intimate partner and gendered violence. Um, as many people are aware, it, it's no secret even to criminologists who came after you who were younger that the book was met with some controversy uh, and um, if I recall, even there was a, you had received some um, unfavorable re reviews from, from people who you know and have known for a long time. And you, I don't know if you're, you were necessarily surprised by that, but maybe perhaps surprised by the depth, the nature of the reactions. Mm -hmm. um, and can you d discuss the book with us and not only the, 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 the origins of the ideas which we've discussed a bit but what you think how do you think that book contributes and how we should view that in your canon and then let's discuss the reaction a bit and maybe if you have some thoughts on what you could have done differently or if you should have all right well this book um i wanted an outlet where i could say what i thought which you can't do in articles you got to write between the lines to some extent. So, all right, I thought I'll write this, and now a number of publishers said, uh, one of them said, this would just destroy us in sociology if we publish this. Hmm. And um, so, but APA Books was interested. And uh, female editors, but they thought, you know, this makes sense. I talked to them later. They said they're glad they did it. They had a debate about whether to do something so controversial. In other words, a book that uh, criticized a feminist approach. Mm. And I was real open about it. And, uh, you, you know, you don't see that open criticism. Where, um, and uh, my brother, incidentally, said I should never openly criticize them. I should have just gone and presented my point of view. But this was the dominant view in violence, the feminist view. So. Uh, and I didn't think it was any good. Mm. And so I was going to criticize it. And what am I writing a book for? Uh, so I did that. So do I have a regret? I paid a price. And continue to pay a price. And people, you may know more than I do, because they don't generally say to my face well, let's, uh, let's, uh, nasty things. Let's touch I, on. But I might just mention, for you, I did, uh, when I, at Albany, when I was going up for a full professor, uh, there was resistance, and I got a terrible vote from in my department. This predated the 2002 text. It did. But this was based. But on based on stuff I had done on gender, and I was, yeah. Mm. Now they would deny it, probably that it was motivated by their activism, but 
Mm. Anyway, but so you and, and you know you do pay a price, and you the people don't read it, the book. They just say they heard things. So, so go perhaps ahead. what is the most controversial portion of the book is that which is focused on the motives of rape and sexual assault. Right. And so for our audience to just give them an overview, the book is more or less split into two sections, one of which is focused on intimate partner violence, not only the, the, the ideology, but then the reaction by both the state and the audience. And then the other portion is focused on, um, in some way, the, an effort, it's an effort to document or explain the gender difference in rape and sexual assault. And much of that is focused on motive. It borrows some evolutionary arguments, symbolic interactionism. Would you, we've talked before, Rich, would you, you've mentioned, and perhaps I'm not characterizing this correctly, but the rape and sexual assault portion of violence and gender reexamined may have been the chief source of the, of the, right. of the reaction. And the, of, it was the, the lightning rod within the text, is yes, that correct? Yes, I think that's correct. And can you explain All maybe right. why that might be, it, it briefly summarize right. your ideas? And before, and before I do that, and, uh, before I forget, um, I couldn't get that book reviewed in sociology or in criminology. So it, there were a few reviews outside the scathing. Mm. <laughs> uh, but, um, Anyway, so yes, the most controversial part was the, the sexual assault. Now, oh, incidentally, very prominent people uh, who reviewed it here for the ASCs uh, privately said they liked, either liked the book and one said they liked the intimate partner violence stuff, uh, but they don't say it publicly. Mm. Okay, but okay, so, and these are, one of them, uh, an ASC president, and the other not, but very prominent. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, sexual motive for rape. Well, you know, it's an Aunt Minnie. It's a, a Bubba psychology. First, you go to the simple thing. Well, they're forcing somebody to have sex. Or in robbery, you're forcing somebody to give you your money. You probably want the money. In, in sexual assault, you know, we probably want to have sex. Now there, let's think about exceptions. Those would be interesting. And let's think of it that way. Start with the simple and say, oh, well, maybe some of them just want to harm. They've got a grievance. They're going to, you know, it's not for the sex. So, all right, that'd be interesting because in some robberies are like that. And, you know, these are grievance crimes. And, uh, that's interesting. Let's study that now. Power. Okay, you think it's a power crime, power motive. Well, what do you mean? I, I, so we studied power back in graduate school in social psych and in sociology. And what do you mean by power? Do you mean a feeling of power? You mean, you know, why don't you think this out and go look at what people have said about power? And do men demonstrate their power by attacking women? Or is that viewed as making them look cowardly? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just think about some of those issues. And um, so I was skeptical. I guess I'm a skeptic. And uh, so I said, there's evidence, that, uh, and I have, you know, lots of evidence that it's got, uh, much of it is motiva sexually motivated. And um, so that's what I wrote. Mm -hmm. And that is very controversial to say. Can you describe some of the reactions that you experienced or you encountered? professionally that you think were misplaced or oh well you know I'm not asked to be I have first of all I don't know most of these reactions mostly at this meeting nobody's come up to me and said called me a name mm -hmm. okay nobody's done that and that generally doesn't happen or they'll they'll make a joke because I tease about it partly I use humor to sort of diffuse it mm. And, uh, but so people will make jokes back to me, okay, about how I'm a provocateur or something. And, um, but in a friendly way, there's no, you know, what people say behind my back, I'm told, I don't know if this is true, 
that people will um, say, oh, you're at Penn State to a graduate student. Uh, what's Felsen like? Or they'll ask. Or something about me, I'm told. But that's not necessarily favorable. Mm. I, you know? But I'm the one they ask about most. But, but the, if social psych evidence says the deviant gets the most attention, <laughs> right? So, so let, let's go back to the ideas in the in the text, and then some of those ideas emerged at, in the in the years since in the in the journals. Um, one idea is, that you focused on in um, a number of papers was that the justice system treats men and women differently in terms of punishment, and that's. Uh, a reflection of the chivalry effect. In, in the book, you anticipated these effects and then um, you, you found evidence of that in those papers. What, what other ideas have you pursued that perhaps the seeds were planted in violence and gender reexamined or in your book with Tedeschi in 94 along the lines of rape and sexual assault, partner violence, that you like to share with us. Okay. So this is more recent. We just had a paper published and we're trying to get another one published on um, blaming the victim. And do we blame rape victims uh, more than we blame other victims? So there again, I'm going to make a comparison. Do we blame rape victims more than we blame robbery victims or assault victims or homicide victims? So we studied that experimentally, which I don't usually do. Right? I mostly use survey research or uh, official statistics. And so we did an experiment, and we presented a scenario, and we asked college students to whether they held the victim at all responsible, or was the victim reckless, or was the victim blameworthy, and we manipulated these scenarios. They, the, the women did, did things like they went uh, got so drunk at a party they blacked out, mm. and, and then, and then a rape occurred, or no, a robbery occurred, or no, nothing happened. So you make these comparisons, and do they blame? Do we blame rape victims more? Um, and they do not. Mm. And um, you know what? what it's just another bubba psychology and many. We, we have a co concept in the law of contributory negligence. So we assign some blame sometimes to victims. And in civil cases, that can affect the, uh, the outcome, how much money is given to, mm -hmm. the, to, the, to the accused. And in um, criminal cases, it's not supposed to play a role. And, but it could. People worry about a zero-sum attribution of blame. And that you assign some blame to the victim, you might be taking it away from the offender. Mm. And people, there, there are some biases, but they're general biases we find about blaming victims, you know? And they're not gender biases. And it doesn't matter if the victim's a male or a female, we find. So, you know, this is to me an obvious sort mm. of thing that we have notions of people engaging in reckless behavior. And, uh, but, uh, you know, it's not talked about. So you obviously in the many years of your career have, and let's think in terms of your work in criminology and aggression, um, had ideas and pursued them and found they led to, uh, let's say, a dead end. Mm -hmm. And those are ideas that perhaps never appeared in print and that none of us would be aware of. Um, for those reasons. Can you think of ideas that you've pursued or questions that you've answered or attempted to answer that have not, uh, did not eventually result in a piece of scholarship? That not that I can, you know, generally, I mean, there could have been something where I just you know, this just didn't go anywhere. An idea, we you, were, it. An idea you were excited about that oh. motivated you for a, a significant period of time that... I can't think of one. I can, what, you know, what we do is, what I, I, what I do is what everybody does. I get real excited about, like, this blaming 
the victim. And I'm thinking, you know, I've been doing this a long time, and I have a certain self-confidence, right? Or you could call it a little arrogance you develop as you get older, and you think, well, I know what's good, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, and uh, so I submit it to a top journal, and all excited, and I think I'm pretty sharp. <laughs> and then, you know, the reviews are scathing. <laughs> Yeah. And now, because I'm experienced, I don't, I think I'm right, and they're full of it, if I can say full of it. And so I sent it to the next lower mm. status journal. And um, as my song I wrote goes, stand by your manuscript. <laughs> and um, uh, so, and then I send it, and then, you know, we had trouble getting that published. And, uh, but finally, it, they get published. Mm -hmm. In my case, I don't have papers sitting. But, uh, so, so that's my answer, best answer I can give. It seems to me that a broad theme across your work is that of the situation. Yep. And as we know, situational studies are rare in criminology and in, in, in the study of aggression and social psychology, you often see them in the laboratory. Mm -hmm. Can you explain the value of studying aggression from the situational level and why or why not you may think that that's a, a profitable level to un unlock more of the mystery of the origins? Okay, and, first and, of all, I'm sorry to interrupt Go ahead. You. Um, first of all, I'm, and I'm seeing this, this meeting, people ask to talk to me there's gonna be more situational stuff coming because of the um, uh, video of mm -hmm. people in public places. And uh, so you're gonna get more studies of fights. Mm. So this is happening uh, as we speak. Mm. So now um, it's useful. First of all, in the study of human behavior, people are very chameleon-like as Goffman showed. And it's very important to study uh, situational factors as a result. I'm not saying individual differences don't matter, but it's clear that, and when I do my studies, I get pretty strong effects, you know, of situational facts, uh, factors, uh, strong coefficients. They're important, and they also have to help explain aggregate variation, mm. like we talked about, why the U.S. might have a higher rate of homicide, but not a higher rate of unarmed assault, and, and why the, the South and North, and, the race issue, you know, why blacks have higher rates mainly of gun violence, um, armed violence. And, you know, you've got to get into why their, their conflicts escalate and the contagion and the arms races that go mm -hmm. on where you've got a gun, I've got to have a gun, what I call adversary effects. And uh, to, so they understand race and violence. Now, I wrote a, thing, a few things on race and violence, and it's pretty recent. but. Um, that's another topic that criminologists have ignored. Mm. Yes. I mean, and when I say race, uh, the key question is why do blacks have higher rates of violent crime? What do you, well, you're not going to even answer that. You're going to talk about statistical interactions between race and class and their effects on violence. Oh, that's good if you, don't, if you want to say I talk about race and violence but don't really say much about it. Mm -hmm. uh, what, you want to know what mediates that difference. Mm -hmm. Look at and sociologists and criminologists can look at mediators. We to, we've got the techniques to do that, so do it. Why haven't we done it? Well, because it's too politically uh, uh, controversial. And, um, uh, but, you know, that I thought, you know, in my career, I thought, well, what is important issues that need to be examined? Well, race differences. And all these people are doing gender stuff from this point of view of activism and, um, and ideology, and I can do something better. What are the effects of alcohol? That clearly plays a role. So I ask, does alcohol play a greater role in violent crime than nonviolent crime? And does it have a causal effect? And that's mm -hmm. where I developed this method and try to sort out causality, if I can say, make such an arrogant remark. And. Um, with a, a, a sort out of causality without experimental data. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, alcohol and guns are important, so I wanted to do stuff on guns. I asked what's important 
And that's what I want to study. Mm. Uh, I don't want another piddly paper, <laughs> you know? So I've attempted to do that. So if we think about, um, uh, sometimes some of us look back and think about what we might have done differently with ideas or with our careers. If you look back sitting here today, I know this is a question sometimes that requires a, a bit of time for one to uh, develop an answer. Would you have done anything differently if you were beginning again? Uh, and my answer is, I don't know. In terms of that intellectual is, interest? Yes. I, would I have gone into sociology, for example? Maybe I wouldn't have. Sociology, to me, is too ideological. Uh, but I know I've gotten benefits from it, so uh, I'm, it's not, I'm not sure. Would I, should I have been more careful in my book and not openly criticized feminists? I was open. I was open about it, as you know. And maybe I should have done that and been more. I've struggled with that all the way along of how um, open and clear should I be yeah. when I write about blaming the victim? Should I actually, should I use the word feminist ever? You know, or, or saying activist, should I, what should I call them? Uh, or should I not mention the, give the interpretation and let people if they have the interpretation of for why, why we blame um, victims as much for robbery and homicide as we do for assault, why don't they just maybe present that result and not interpret it? Mm -hmm. And, but then it gets hidden, but nobody cites it. Uh, and, you know, they don't get the point. So you think in some way that you've often been, um, not intentionally, but involved in a kind of wrestling match, um, where you've been a spectator to this wrestling match of where advocacy is competing against science. And a lot of your work, for one reason or another, is, 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 is lands within that arena. Absolutely. And you think, if, if, you, if people will watch this a year from now, 10 years from now, or longer, and many young scholars are aware that that competition's one that can not lead to a productive career for a variety of reasons. Would you advise them to avoid those questions that seem to, to, to though they can be answered with good science, they seem to be uh, embraced by certain positions that are not receptive to science? Or do you, is there another way? Have you found the other way to Yep. To no, you avoid them before you get tenure. And once you get tenure, first of all, the whole idea of tenure was supposedly to l allow people to f express their opinions. So once you get tenure, then you can do it. However, know that you're going to pay a price. And, uh, it, you know, you've got to live with that. Now, on the other hand, if you go to this uh, and you do a scientific approach, it's an unusual and there's a wide open space for ideas, because all of this has been dominated by ideology. So if you do go into violence against women, wait your tenure, then, you know, there's lots of things to be done. So what's, so if you were, if you were to identify one potential um, it, consequence of the, um, the activist conclusions regarding the origins of intimate partner violence in terms of policy, in terms of the way we, we think about managing partner violence, what would that be? What would they recommend? And what would you recommend based on the evidence that you've right. accumulated? Well, first of all, they'd use this uh, dominance wheel and they'd, at the shelters, they'd try to interpret things things from a feminist point of view. That's what they do at these shelters. And in their counseling of women and telling them that he's got this, wants to dominate, and uh, I think it's problematic because they, well, first of all, evidence suggests that it's, this doesn't work, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 this approach. And uh, um, now, my, what would I recommend? Well, one thing, I'd say, I'd confess, 
that my, I'm not too creative in my ideas about prevention. And so I don't pretend to know what, what is best. I'm sort of saying this other thing doesn't work. In prevention, I tend to, focus, to accept my brother's point of view, try to reduce opportunity if mm -hmm. you can, and as opposed to therapy or educational programs and all that. I tend to follow and say, talk to my brother. They'll give you some ideas on that and very creative, and, and I'm not so good for mm -hmm. that. But um, I would say one thing, I'm not, when you say to victims, you call them survivors, and you tell them this is going to traumatize you, you've got PTSD because of this violent act. There are costs to that. You're making it worse than it might be for them. Mm. When you assume, you know, from rape or in a partner violence. It's like when you go into the hospital to visit a friend who has cancer. You have a dilemma. You don't want to say, you don't want to be cheery, oh, this is no big deal. Obviously, it's a big deal. But you don't want to say, oh, you're going to die soon. Uh, your life is over. This, um, this is a fate, you know, with rape, this is a fate worse than death. Yeah, that's too much. Hmm. You've got to go to a middle course. And they're not going to a middle course. They're saying, this is, uh, you know, I have my students say, rape is a fate worse than death. Let's not uh, exaggerate, and let's not understate it. Mm. I mean, it's good for the movement to, uh, to say your, your life is over. This is your ruin. You've got PTSD long term. You're, uh, it's good for the movement, but it's not necessarily good for the victim. Mm. So let's move um, from there and, and, and more broadly. Um, what, what do you uh, consider your um, strongest work? What, what, which piece of scholarship are you most proud? It's interesting because sometimes when I get one of these negative reviews from, I'm not sure if I do it then, but sometimes I'll look and list what I think are my good ideas. Yeah. And uh, just to motivate myself and say, look, I've done good work. I should feel good about mm -hmm. it, you mm -hmm. know, just to convince myself. And so I don't really uh, um, know what I'm most proud of. Uh, I think, in the way I think the gender stuff, that gender book I think is very good. And uh, How long did you work on it? I can remember a couple years, I think. Uh, I don't remember, though. Uh, but I thought that really, you know, I made a lot of these comparisons, and that was real convincing. But, and some people, you know, it generated, I got people who loved it. But, you know, it, it, it made me into a deviant in this field. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a price to be paid. Anything from your... Earlier interest oh, in the self, self-concept? That I think, so there also I was a, um, a non-conformist, I guess, because I was studying at IU mm -hmm. uh, the self-concept among these symbolic interactionists, like Shell Stryker and all. And I said, my evidence, I didn't, suggested the reflect, that the looking glass self was not as, um, uh, did not occur as much as the symbolic interactions were saying. And so I challenged that basic idea in symbolic interactions. Mm. And I did it based on my evidence. I didn't come into that thinking that. It just, and that made me, I started thinking, well, people don't really tell you what they think of you. So how's the looking glass self operate? How do you come to see yourself as others see you when I don't know what you think of them? You don't know what they think of me. And, you know, people are biased. I'd like to think you think I'm wonderful. But, you know, uh, it's, it, it, there's inter communication barriers. So I wrote about those, and I published a number of papers like that. And uh, that was a nonconformist type thing, I mm. think. 
but that was a contribution, I think. Mm -hmm. So at one point, you were more active in the ASAs, American Sociological Association. Oh, yeah. More active in sociology. It's a yes, I always went to the ASA meetings. And, and if you, know, you attended the ASAs I don't regularly? Anymore, no, I try to stay away from that place. So <laughs> if people, were, people would like, uh, we often like to categorize people or labels, you would label yourself as a criminologist? Absolutely. In 1985, you would label yourself as a? Sociologist. At any point, a social psychologist? Oh. Did I ever say social psychologist? Sometimes I might have said that, right? But you I mean, you say, you say sociologist is a conversation stopper to people outside. <laughs> you say criminologist, oh, a criminologist, yeah, was, was so, uh, the latest. Is, you think so-and-so is guilty? <laughs> <laughs> of course, they don't want to know what you, they're going to tell you whether they think they're guilty. So you attend, you you're, have, have been um, attending ASC meetings, it seems to be for... Since the 90s, I think. Quite a while. And yeah, they're a fun group. And you, you find that criminology is then your, your disciplinary home? Yeah. But they're a bad influence on me. They, <laughs> all this party uh, drinking and all, and I'm an innocent, sweet uh, person, but <laughs> under peer pressure. So let's, uh, let's talk about the state of the field. We have a little more time here, and I think this is what often interests people a great deal especially younger scholars, as they think about the playing field. So, and you can describe um, uh, your thoughts or give us your thoughts on sociology or criminology or psychology or behavioral econ, whatever interests you, but you know, your general thoughts on the intellectual professional state of, let's say, criminology, but perhaps cognate disciplines. Um, well, are, you know, are there questions that we all have to be turning our attention to? Are there, um, intellectual streams that you think we should abandon because they've been... Uh-oh. Um, uh, well... And I find that many scholars at your, at, at, at your stage of the career often have, seem, seem to have developed um, kind of uh, concrete assessments of things. And, 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 and so... Uh, well, it's too... Um, it's two activists. Or, I mean, they're two. They're, it's a mix, right? And it's. Can you explain what you mean by that? Um, well, there's depending on the area. It's. Uh, um, it's b b can be very ideological. And uh, that you know, there's not going to be if you're in the bubble. You're not going to hear other. Um, Sides, and I'm a you know I'm a I've never voted for a Republican. I'm a center left person, but there's far le a lot of far left people, and you know they're going to talk about the evils of mass incarceration, and they're going to uh, take a feminist approach to gender and violence, and if you see what the students are studying in their poster sessions and you go through there, it's not very interesting stuff, you know that they're doing, and. Um, so that, to me, there are these negatives, but there's also good work being done. And this emphasis on which theory is strain theory versus self-control theory, and there's, I understand less of that now, of, mm. of that, which I think is good. Uh, so, you know, I like, um, there's not good things going on in the situational crime prevention and routine activities approach. I sort of, and I'm not in that really, but I envy they have their group of people and they accept certain scientific principles and they make progress and I, I think that's So you would impressive. think, it, it seems to be that one concern you have is that science doesn't seem to be the preferred method of inquiry. Well, it's a mix, right? And or, or it's, it's biased, it's a mix between science and ideology. I see. You know, they, you couldn't say you were a Republican in this field and you, or you'd be uh, tart and feathered. Um, but uh, that's not good. You know, you need open uh, conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you really want diversity, get diversity of opinion on and on, by that sort of thing, not to, the, you know, m more of a certain. Uh, demographic group. So you, 
more or less departed from sociology, at least concrete terms, um, as indicated by your the fact that you no longer attend the ASA. Is, did, did that break occur in part because you were concerned about the, the, the kind of the, the powerful current of activism in sociology? Yes, absolutely. Um, Was it? Is it? Is the current stronger now than in the 70s and 80s in I, sociology? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's gotten worse. And what's the consequence of that for us as? In sociology? In, yeah, for, for, but for people interested in those ideas and people interested in pursuing the, the answers. A lack of progress. Uh, you know, a lot of name calling. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, it's... Uh, it's a shame. So, um, we, you mentioned this a bit, Rich, but if you could just ex ex expand on this a bit more, what, what questions ought we be turning to as young scholars or, or any scholar who might be watching this that you think we, we continue to overlook or that deserve uh, reevaluation? Well, why? Do blacks have higher rates of violent crime than whites? And you don't think the current volume of research has adequately answered that question? Or is it the, the quality or the nature of the outcome that hasn't been adequately addressed? Well, first of all, there's a, I think it's important, and this has been another theme in my work, I think it's important to distinguish between crime and violence. Uh, crime includes nonviolent crime, of course, and violent crime. And violent crime is aggression, intentional harm doing, where crime is deviance or rule breaking. Mm -hmm. And there's over, there are overlapping domains, right? Uh, and so be clear about what your dependent variable is. And if your independent variable predicts violent crime only, then you've, uh, you've got to use a theory of violence. So that's been a big theme of mine that I hadn't mentioned till now mm -hmm. in this discussion. Get the right dependent variable. And if it's rule breaking, okay, you know, you're going to use control theory. Well, okay, control theory predicts for nonviolent and violent. So you, if you don't get a fact for nonviolent, you got a problem. A theory should predict what it, uh, uh, certain things and it shouldn't predict other things and if it over predicts that's problematic and if it under predicts so you've got to pay attention to your dependent variable get the right dependent variable and that sometimes requires you to look at multiple outcomes mm -hmm. and say oh look at this pattern and that leads to theory development too because let's say you're going to study violence against women and violence against men and you get it you only get it for violence against women but this, well, that suggests there's something special about violence against women. But if you get it for both, then you need a more general theory. Mm. Okay, so that, you know, that's part of my work. Um, you know, um, we did one biologically rated um, study. We found that um, pubertal development was associated not just with violence but crime generally. Well, that I don't know the mechanism, mm -hmm. but uh, it, that guide you to how you're going to try to explain it. So what would you suggest uh, to future generations watching this recording about what it takes to achieve success in criminology? Well, I, I'm trying not to state the obvious. You know, you, you, you got to work so hard and you got to be persistent and you've got to uh, take criticism mm -hmm. and and uh, recover and uh, right you, and you got to have a certain level of ability uh, and sometimes you can't be creative because you don't have that in you and so maybe you know but you can still achieve and uh, use other people's uh, ideas and and be a very competent methodology, a methodologist that could, that gets you pretty far, uh, and you know I have my limitations in that area, mm -hmm. but I'm, but uh, I rely on others for that more. But uh, you know people have skill in that. That that's a that can be a very marketable thing. So mm -hmm. uh, 
There are different ways to skin a cat. Your thoughts on interdisciplinary work. Your work is um, interdisciplinary in many ways. You had mentioned that you've actually you've dabbled in biology, you've drawn on psychology, oh. sociology. Recently, I think you had a paper of, you drew on prospect theory or something. Oh, yeah, economics. So do you see value in that? that to, uh, yeah. Can you explain? Behavioral economics. For younger scholars, why that might be important based on your experience? Well, you're looking at offender decision making and people taking risks and people seeming to do things that you say, what the hell did they do that for? What were they thinking? And so, you know, behavioral economics, which is actually just derived from social psychological ideas about biased decision making, uh, uh, you, you can use that, those ideas from there. They're very, some very sharp people in that area. And you can borrow those ideas to look at offender decision making. And, and you know, you're not assuming rationality, you're su assuming bounded rationality. Mm -hmm. And people ignore the costs. And why might they ignore the costs? And the, you know the behavioral uh, behavioral economics is useful, I think. And in, in uh, I don't know a whole lot about it, but I have used it looking at victim resistance. Mm. Why do victims resist the cops when they're probably going to get caught? But you know they're desperate, uh, and uh, when people are desperate, they do some stupid things you th that appear stupid afterwards. Well, we have time, I think, for uh, maybe one or two more questions before we wrap up for today. Um, you know, you are near the end of your career, but we assume that you'll be active and uh, in, uh, around for a long time, but it, this may be the last time you're interviewed in this type of forum and the last time you're given an opportunity to reflect uh, on your career in a way where many others can have the opportunity to hear what you said and see you speak the words. Um, how would you like um, people to remember you as a scholar? Mm. On my tombstone, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> um, well, as an independent thinker, um, I, yeah, and um, right, I, well, this is, I'd like them to say not, oh, he tried to provoke people. But uh, I, he, he did independent thinking and he showed some courage. Now, I don't feel like I was courageous because in the back of my mind I thought, oh, well, this will, I don't want negative opinion. I mm. want um, positive appraisal like anybody else. And I want, oh, they'll come around to my way of thinking. Mm. So that's not courage. That's self-interest. But, you know, you pay a price. I was willing to pay the price. I'd like them to to acknowledge that a bit, as opposed to attributing it to some psychological problem. Oh, you just like to provoke people. Mm -hmm. And partly that may come from the fact that I tease people a lot, to use humor, and so, but I'm not trying, I don't go when I tease them to, to sensitive things. I like it, any, you know, mm -hmm. I try to be funny and, uh, uh, and not at ex their, their expense. I do a lot of self-deprecating humor. So I, um, uh, that's how I want to be remembered. And the ideas you think you would like people to And for remember. being funny and for um, my uh, CD uh, uh, with, with Stand By Your Manuscript <laughs> and other uh, hit tunes. <laughs> Am I allowed to be the silly yeah. a little bit? Okay. Anything else, Rich, that you would like to mention that you think merits inclusion on the record? Oh. Things that you would like to discuss? Things that you have so much, and there's so much ground to cover, but yeah. I know we've touched on many oh. of the core themes, but... All right. Well, maybe our little review. Do you do a review here a little? I don't know if I can do it. So I say get the right dependent variable. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about deviance? Are you talking about violence? Bring in the... Some of what we study is not deviance. It's intentional harm doing. Remember, when you use a violent uh, rate of homicide or something as the deep end of variable, you may you be, should be looking at uh, theories of uh, violence, not crime. Mm. But think about it and look at other dependent variables and see, uh, you know, that'll help you and, and contribute to how you think about it. So get the right dependent variable. Um, 
pay attention to situational factors as well, and that all, not all fights are the same, and that there's an escalation process often, not in predatory violence, but there too sometimes, and that you've got to look at the role of the adversary or victim. They play an important role, as do third parties, so you've got to look at third party effects, and that uh, you're still, you know, interacting with individual differences. Biological factors are going to prove more and more important. It's clearly it's going that direction, mm -hmm. and you better acknowledge that. And that's not taking away work from us. You know, we still can look at situational factors interacting with biological factors. So don't be afraid of that, and don't get too caught up in these airy fairy sociological theories and the patriarchy and the you know, and all that stuff, mm -hmm. right? Go for the concrete and the simple and get into the pro crime prevention and maybe the uh, situational crime prevention and routine activities types of thing. That's a useful thing as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's my take on the field. It's a guide going forward. Well, Rich, I've enjoyed the conversation and um, thank you so much for sitting with us. And Thank uh, you. All right. Okay.